Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. This is episode four of the video series where I critique and process your image. Today we're taking a look at this great scene from Slovenia sent to us by Reed. I like the composition a lot. I think Reed did a great job of capturing a lot of depth in the image. You might remember in a, a couple episodes ago I mentioned how Ansel Adams likes to uh, portray depth in his images by not giving you a lot of sky. So we don't have a ton of sky up here. Instead, as Ansel Adams does and as Reed did in this image, we have a lot of foreground and midground detail that leads to the background. So that really gives a sense of depth. Adding to that sense of depth in this case, we have this great leading line of this road coming through the image. Then we have a focal point in the shot as well. We have the man on the bicycle and he seems fairly close just eyeballing it to me. He seems fairly close to like the rule of thirds maybe just a touch on the inside. Actually we could check. We'll just open up the crop tool and we have the rule of thirds overlay and you can see he's he's directly on the lower horizontal third line. So he's right on that. He's just a little bit inside of the actual intersection point of the horizontal and vertical line on the lower right quadrant. So if he was technically a foot or so to the right, it would be more perfect. And I'm making finger quotes, air finger quotes in the air right now. Um, but I mean, we're just splitting hairs there. This is really a nice composition, did a great job. So there's no problem with composition at all. I think uh, Reed did a fantastic job. Now, as far as his settings, he used a uh, 24 to 104 5 millimeter lens at 28 millimeters. It's an f/4 lens. And remember, we mentioned that um, if you want to use your lens at its best, you'd like to be two to four stops up from wide open. Wide open is f/4. He shot at f/11. That's three stops up from f/4. It's f/4, f/5.6, f/8, f/11. So three stops up he's perfect um, very well done um, you know no problem with that I think this is a great great composition now the other question I often get and I mentioned this in previous episodes is where do you focus and uh, I mentioned I'm not a big fan of hyperfocal distance I'm not saying it doesn't work hyperfocal distance works great to me I think it's kind of inconvenient you have to have an app on your phone then you have to have a way to actually focus on that hyperfocal distance your app is telling you to focus at which can be very difficult to do in this case for me I would have used single point focus and I would focus right on this guy uh, right here because he is really the 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 subject of the image everything else is a beautiful backdrop and it is a you know great backdrop so we have a lot of visual weight here we have the man who's kind of small compared to this great mountain scape in the background so it's really a nice composition but I would focus on him we mentioned there's usually three kind of rules of thumb on focusing you either could focus on a strong subject in a landscape scene or you could focus a third of the way up into the scene or you could use that hyperfocal distance and focus there Optimally, if hyperfocal hyper distance was very easy to do in the field, I would recommend do that. That would work out great. Other than that, I recommend focusing on something that is a strong subject in the scene. If that isn't in the scene, you don't have a strong subject, it's just a great landscape, then focus one third of the way up in the scene. Now, I there is a plugin I want to mention that is available for Lightroom, and it's free, that will show you what the focus points were that Reed used. Um, I have it installed. You have to access it through the library module. So you go to the library module and you go up to the top menu library and you go down to plugin extras and it's called show focus points. And we're going to click there and another window will open. And you can see that now it has these focus points here. So that's telling us that um, Reed used multiple focus points. He didn't use a single focus point. And if you look over here, it says that the camera reports the focus subject distance as being between 3.86 meters and 5.24 meters. The depth of field is from 1.55 meters to infinity. So that's awesome because everything in the foreground is in focus all the way through infinity we have great focus um, also it's mentioning that the hyperfocal distance is 2.34 meters and that's why I say it's kind of difficult in the field to 
focus at that point. You'd have to have a tape measure to measure it out exactly and have something there to focus on. Um, now, he, he missed the hyperfocal distance a little because it's at 3.86 meters to 5.24 uh, meters. So that uh, didn't, um, you know, that I, what I'm trying to say, it just goes to prove you don't religiously have to hit that hyperfocal distance to get a great image. And he did here. And he used uh, 11 point uh, multi-point um, focus points. And that's it. Um, so that shows you uh, what it did. Now, if it was mine and I used that single focus point and I put it on the guy here, this screen would just show one focus point right on the guy. Uh, so it gives that. Now, one uh, thing about this, I'll have a link to this um, this software, this plugin, in the description below the video. It only works with some Canon cameras, some Nikon cameras, and very, very few Sony cameras from what I understand. It doesn't work with any other cameras. So just keep that in mind, but it is free as far as I know. So technically um, and compositionally, I think the, the picture's awesome. I think he did a great job. Now processing it, I always like to go in with a goal in mind of what I want to achieve. Well. There's a lot of depth already, so I don't have to really do much in post-processing to try to create the illusion of depth in the image that's already there. Um, there's a lot of tonal range in the image, so I really don't have to worry about that. What I have to be careful about is that I don't make it too colorful, too HDR-like. I think it's a great natural shot, and I want to avoid doing that. Um, I want to make sure that this road is prominent, so it really helps lead the viewer's eye through the image. I don't want to do any type of processing that would diminish the uh, the uh, effect that that might have on the image. So I want to make sure that this road is prominent and um, pretty much just process it along and we'll see how we go. Now, typically, actually, I start with lens corrections. I remove chromatic aberration and enable lens, uh, enable profile corrections right away. Now, a lot of people uh, email me and they say when they click this the picture often gets brighter and the reason for that is because some lenses naturally will add a vignette they just the way the lens is it will vignette your scene and when you click this uh, Lightroom is taking away that vignette that the lens put onto the scene and if you look over at the left side of the image over here when I enable the profile corrections you could see it gets brighter it's because it's removing that vignette. So um, some lenses, it will look like the entire screen got, or the entire scene got considerably brighter. It's natural. It's nothing's wrong with Lightroom. It's supposed to do that. And that's why typically I like to do lens corrections first, then go up to the basic panel and do some adjustments. Now, what I tend to do is I make the image flat to begin with. And the way I would do that is I bring highlights down, not all the time. In this case, I'm going to bring them all the way down. But um, usually, uh, I'll bring highlights down somewhat. Uh, in this image here, to put it back, I'm going to put it back to where it was. If you hit the J key on your keyboard, you'll get your clipping indicators. And we'll see where we're clipping. And we could see we're clipping the whites up here in the sky. We're not clipping any blacks that I could see. Yeah, blacks, if we were clipping blacks, you'd get blue. Uh, there. Hit J key again and it will turn those off. So you could leave it on actually if you want. You could bring highlights down until those go away if you want. And then um, hit J again still to make sure they're off. But anyway, I'm going to bring them down even more because I want to add, you know, just a little more depth up in there. I'm going to open up the shadows. And now because I opened up the shadows, it's a flatter image. There's not as much tonal variation between the darks and the lights. But I do that on purpose because I end up adding contrast to the image, which will make it uh, more you know, contrasty. Now, I don't want to go too crazy with vibrance and saturation because, I, as I mentioned, I, one of my goals here is not to make this too colorful. But I am going to add some vibrance, a little bit more than I typically would, because I'm not going to add any saturation at all. So we're just going to add some vibrance. Around 20 is good. Then what I usually do next is I go to the tone curve and I add contrast with the tone curve. And I check out the, the preset medium contrast and the preset strong contrast. And I like medium contrast in this instance. We're going to go back up to the basic panel. And I'm going to get a white point by holding in the shift key and double clicking on the word whites. And that gives me that white point. Now I could double 
check my clipping indicators at this point and hit the J key and see if I'm clipping and I'm not. So that's good. And then I'm going to double click on the blacks. I suspect that the blacks are going to make this too dark for my taste in through here where these pine trees are. But we're going to do that anyway. And yeah, it, it's a little too dark. I'll hit the J key again. You can see we, we are clipping a little here. Um, but I think I'll, I'll just roll that back a little so that clipping's totally gone. Hit the J key again to make sure my clipping indicators are off. Just eyeballing it, I still don't like it. It's a little too dark. I'm going to hold the Alt or Option key in. It's Alt if you have a PC option. If you have a Mac, click on that. And I could see that nothing is clipping at all. So sometimes you'll get some colors clipping first. You can see I got some blues over in here clicking. You know, blue, red, and green is what would clip. And I'm clipping blue. So I would pull that back till that's gone. And that's okay. Uh, so I like my basic panel processing there. Now, uh, somebody mentioned in one of the comments for one of the previous videos about using a graduated filter. I'm not a big fan of graduating filters, uh, t graduated filters. To me, they don't look natural, generally, and I don't like them. And secondly is I usually add a vignette on my image, one of the last things I do. And if you have a graduated filter that you brought down exposure, when you add that um, vignette on top of it, it often is too dark then at the top. So, um, like for instance, if I did the graduate filter, I'd bring, let's, in this case, I'd bring exposure down a little bit and I would hold the shift key in and then go up here and click at the top and that way it's pulling it straight down, pulling the graduated filter straight down, not on an angle. And, you know, it looks okay uh, in this case. A lot of times though, to me, it doesn't look natural. And again, I will add a vignette and it will kind of give you the same effect in a way. So I'm going to get rid of that. That's why I just don't, I'm not a big fan of graduated filters. Um, the detail, I bring sharpening all the way down. I got a lot of questions. Why do I do this? I'm crazy. Well, I do add a dynamic contrast later often in on one. I also use, um, I forgot what they called it. Uh, it's in Nick software. Nick software is free, the plugins, and it's in, um, it's in color effects four in Nick software. And there is a contrast filter in there. I just forgot what they call the exact filter, but it's almost identical to dynamic contrast in on one software. It does almost the same thing. And I will add one of those two, depending on which plugin I use. And it, and it really sharpens up the image. And those of you that have tried probably, or have dabbled in stock photography, that means selling your images to stock agencies, micro stock agencies, or at least placing your images with micro stock agencies like, you know, Sh Shutterstock and Dreams Time and uh, places like that. I think the number one reason, well, the number two reason why I think that images get rejected is because they're over sharpened. Uh, we tend to over sharpen our images, just I guess it's a natural thing. And it doesn't always look natural. And this is something I'm always battling with myself about over sharpening an image. So um, be careful about sharpening, particularly if you ever want to sell images and sell them through stock agencies specifically too. You, you don't want your images overly sharpened. Um, also, if you sharpen too much, it tends to enhance the noise in the image also. And too much noise in an image is the number one reason images get rejected from stock agencies. So be careful with sharpening. Um, now as far as this, it's ISO 100 and there really isn't any noise that I could see in the image. So I'm not even going to worry about noise reduction here. So I'm just taking my sharpening all the way down to zero. We already did lens corrections. There's really nothing else I want to do in Lightroom on this image. I want to bring it over to my plugin, and I'm going to use On One um, Effects 10 again. I have links for all this stuff that I talk about in the description below the video if you want to check it out more. And I just want to remind everyone that um, this is the way I process images, and that's the whole idea. Uh, I'm just showing you how I do it and, and to give you ideas. And maybe you don't ever want to use On One, but it will give you ideas of what you could do with Lightroom and or maybe with um, Nick software that I talked about, something like that. So it's going to create a TIFF or a PSD, I'm sorry, we're going to send it over there to on one. And again, I want to be very conscious of the fact that I want to make sure that I don't go too crazy uh, with color, uh, making it look 
um, almost, I don't want to make it look too HDR looking. I want to make it more natural. So I'm going to add a filter and I'm going to add that dynamic contrast we talked about before. And you can see how that really sharpens it up more or less. And um, it does a nice job. So I, I kind of like that. Sometimes it, it is a little too much and I will back it off a little bit. So I'm going to back this one off to around 70. So that's this opacity slider. And there's uh, before, after, before, after. Okay, so that's dynamic contrast. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to just affect the color of the mountains in the background. Um, a lot of mountains, they kind of look bluish or purplish. Um, and these this mountain here just the way the sun is it's it's not really expressing that i want to uh, add that a little bit so i'm going to add a color enhancer and it uh, did an auto tone adjustment and i automatically and i don't want it to do that so i turn that off and i want to go down here to color range and i want to go to the blues and i'm really now it's going to affect the entire image what i do here but i'm going to mask it off later so it only affects the uh, mountains so what I want to do is with the blues, I want to turn saturation up just a little, not a lot. Like again, I got to be careful that I don't overdo things. So just a little bit. And I'm going to then um, click on the mask. I'm going to invert the mask. So now it's going to take that effect away from everything. And then I'm just going to, um, I'm going to turn on the mask overlay so I could see where I'm painting. And I am going to paint in the effect on the mountains, roughly. All right, now I don't, you know, it's I did it subtly, so it's not, it's not something where um, it's going to look unnatural if I miss a spot. It's just going to be subtle adjustment. So we're just going to come through here, I think, and do these mountains like that. I'm going to turn the mask overlay off. Okay, that's all I want to do. Now, I was talking about I want to make sure this road is prominent throughout the image, and I think the grass is a little bright. So I'm going to add another color enhancer, and I'm going to again turn off auto. I don't want it to auto adjust the color temperature or anything. And I'm going to go down here to green, and I'm going to take the brightness of the green down. And you can see how now the grass is darker, but it seems in relation now it made the road look brighter and more prominent. Uh, there's before, there's after. There's before, there's after. There's before, there's after. Now, one could argue that the trees, maybe I made too dark with that adjustment. I could paint it out. I could also do a tone enhancer. That made everything a little too bright. I just don't like that, and I think that would be too much work. So I'm going to go back to my, I deleted that, I'm going to go back to the color enhancer, and I'm going to add a mask, and I'm going to mask it out of these uh, trees. So I'm making the grass darker, but I'm not going to be making any of this back here darker. See how it brightened it up a little bit. It was a subtle adjustment in the trees. It was more dramatic of an adjustment on the grass. Like that. All right. And um, I think we'll add a vignette. And a strong vignette. That looks good to me. All right. Now, it is a little dark in here, but it does add a lot of depth to the image, too. Um, I'm debating whether I should do anything to brighten that up. So we'll go to the tone enhancer. We're going to turn off auto. We're going to open up the shadows a little bit and just a little. Then I'm going to get the mask and I'm going to invert the mask. So it's turned it off basically, but I'm going to paint it in over in here. Just give a little more detail up in there. Maybe down in here, get a smaller brush by hitting the left back a key. All right, I kind of like that now. I'm going to move my vignette on top of everything. Put the vignette on top, if possible. There we go. There. 
I'd say that's done. So I'm going to click apply. And then it's going to save all the on one effects that I did to it and return us to Lightroom. And there is our processed image. There is our Lightroom processed image. And if we go back to the import, that's what it looked like in, in import. So and there we are processed. Import processed. Raw file processed. So I kind of like what I did with it. I think uh, I, I it satisfies what my goals were. I didn't in my mind, at least looking at it now, overdo it. Now, I had mentioned before that when you're in front of your computer so long processing an image, your eyes sometimes get to be uh, fatigued and a little bit numb to some of the colors. So it's best to walk away for a while and then come back, and then your mistakes will stand out more readily. Also, I recommend that you don't share the image until you do that, until you walk away for a while and then come back, just to make sure that it's not really overdone, um, you know, overall. So that's it. That's the way I would go about processing this image. I'd like to thank Reed for sharing it with us. Uh, it's an awesome image. I like. Uh, I wish I was there in this scene to take this shot. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone that watches my videos and supports what I'm trying to do. I really do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.